welcome everybody to our school board meeting tonight. We'll start with the what we pledge to do. We have a full board here today. Everyone has been. Uh, I didn't ask anybody to say, Dr. Wright, would you give us a pledge of allegiance? Yes, sir. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. I Right, the first item on the agenda is uh, recognition and acceptance of a donation to the Woodridge School District. This was a donation of art supplies for the amount of one hundred fifty dollars to Peggy. Peggy from Peggy Bams. Is that Bams? Did I say that right? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, we have sent a note thanking her, haven't we? Yes, sir. I have a motion to accept that donation for that amount. I have a motion for. Spring Hall, I have a second from Margaret. All in favor? Thank you. Um, next item on the agenda is recognition of our BR Star Awards for August. Dr. Wright, would you take over? Absolutely. I, I just, we asked uh, our folks not to attend just out of safety, but Tanya Malusi Malus and also Cynthia Roethlisberger are both BR Stars for the month of August. Tanya has done a, a remarkable job of helping with the technology and the needs of the teachers and training. And she has uh, just done an outstanding job, kind of gone above and beyond. Same as Cynthia has done with the support of our special education department and our children in that area, has done a remarkable job. So we'd just like to thank them and recognize them. We'll issue those uh, shortly. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. Uh, next item on the agenda is the consent agenda, which consists of the minutes of previous meetings, vouchers, and reports, some personnel items, uh, other items. Uh, any member of the board have anything after reviewing the consent agenda that you'd like to take out and vote on individually? If not, then we'll ask for a, uh, a motion to accept the consent agenda. We have a motion from Chuck. We have a second. Margaret, all in favor of accepting the consent agenda as written. Thank you. That's unanimous. Hey, item 4.1 recommendation to approve the Southern One Tower land lease agreement. We do this every year, don't we, Dr. Wright? This is actually uh, uh, the first year of a new lease. We have uh, been operating under a prior lease. And so we recently negotiated a 68% increase. Uh, SLA One was fair with us, we were fair with them. It's like they're actually a good partner. They've been, uh, they've come to our aid when we needed hot spots and have been fair to us. And so this represents an honest deal for both all parties included. And so we're asking for the board's approval. It will be for a five year period renewable every 364 days. Is that standard or will it be just one set rate for five years? Set rate for five years. Set rate. There is a 2% escalator in the 2%. Okay. Any questions regarding that? We have a motion to accept item 4.1. Have a motion from Diana and a second from Chuck. All in favor? Yes, thank you. Item 4.2, recommendation to approve in-person learning September 16th for grades K through 12. This is kind of exciting. Dr. Wright, do you want to explain the process? Absolutely. If you recall, we have rolled out a three-stage process and each stage has a specific phase of instruction. We've been operating under online only instruction since August 10th. And uh, before we go on, I want to thank the principals and teachers and support staff for doing an outstanding job of making that uh, significant paradigm shift. And so it has been not just a, a, a mild adjustment, it's been a paradigm shift. It's been a complete transformation. The next phase, we were waiting for both state approval and county approval for the thresholds of the presence of COVID and also hospitalization rates to decline to at least the levels that would enable us to go to a hybrid, which would be twice daily. The other three days would be online. That allows for us to have half the students on campus at any time, enabling us to physical and social distance. And so the recommendation to the board is that uh, we move to phase two or the second phase, which is 
the hybrid AD schedule. Um, to add a little more detail for the board's information, students programmers and avid, but 99.9 we want to group those kids when we do that. And it hasn't been easy, but our principals are making that accommodation. Uh, and the other part of that is uh, when we serve our teachers, uh, 80, 85 out of, uh, excuse me, 84 out of the 88 are supportive of, an, of a hybrid. They're comfortable with supporting students twice weekly because they know they can physically distance. They have half the students at a time. And so I, I'm confident we'll get the support of our teachers and we have the support of our sports staff to be able to properly support these kids. We will be running the buses uh, Monday through Thursday and Friday for those students that are getting on-site services for special education, ELL, or those that are in foster care settings. Meals will be provided both in the morning and lunch time. I have one question. Do you know if this would be any kind of an extra strain on the teachers to do this, or are they looking forward to this? I would say yes, this is going to require an added effort for a teacher. I mean, they're sort of spinning two plates at once. Uh, I, I, I would say anecdotally, the feedback I had, the majority of teachers are excited to get their kids back. And they, many would like them back every day. I understand we need to take a, a measured approach to this and, and, and make sure that we're operating in a responsible way. Questions from the board? Jennifer. All right, so with phase two, how long are we going to continue with that phase before we move to the next phase? It depends on local condition and also countywide condition. We would not consider it until the county had said you have minimal, minimal presence, and the state agreed that the county had minimal presence in the local area of High Top Lakeside. And then we'd have to just uh, get a sense of how comfortable, frankly, our teachers are with assuming a little bit more risk. We would have to see the impact of flu or if there's a second wave of the virus. So there's a number of viruses, there's a number of indicators that will be evaluated prior to moving forward. There's not a set date. So we're still planning as part of phase two, would be like a phase two B, is that is the kindergarten K through three that would start with the all day programs for the everyday of the program? Correct. Right. So when it's safe, we would begin with the primary grades, probably start kindergarten and first grade and see how that went. Um, We're giving ourselves about two weeks to see how that goes. At least at that time, we won't know the impact of the Labor Day until, because the data is, is delayed, uh, we, by about 12 days, we won't know until the 25th of this month. At that time, we'll have a better measure, and then we will have had a substantial number of students in school for a period of time to be able to evaluate the impact. Good. So we're starting very gradual and progressing forward. So whenever everything changes back, our system is allowing us, if there's something that happens where the cases are severe again, then we can easily transition to our back to the program that we were doing previous. Correct. 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 Okay. And then, so we don't know the length of phase two at this time. We do not. And then adequately, whenever we make a decision to to move from phase one to a phase two to a phase three, we might get a week or so or more. We would provide notice. I would think before we went to Monday through Friday on a full person, uh, we, it'll be clear that it, it is uh, it's safe to do so. It won't be a, it, it, it won't. It, admittedly, when you go from one phase to the next, it's, there's a little bit of risk that you're assuming. Right now, of course, the safest thing is Always stay in your home and never leave. But that's not without impact to students and families. So uh, it'll be abundantly clear that it's safe for us to proceed before we would go to the third phase. Can you, can you put the mic? I can, I'm having a hard time here. Okay. Hold on. I have questions that are sent to me, but I'm supposed to respond to them. Just put, put the mic on. Oh, so have someone that comes to school, for example, and then they are recognized for more concern. Those individuals on a case-by-case -case basis can then re revert back to maybe an online environment. 
Yes, and students and parents and families can remain online only the entire year. When the time comes that it's safe, whenever that will be this year or next, that we can go full in person five days a week. Families uh, wanting to go AB will be able to accommodate that. So there'll be an online component, I believe, going forward. So I guess there's concerns of individuals that are going to this AB schedule that right. once they go to AB and they're all of a sudden they change their mind and want to go back to online. That's on a case by case basis. They can make a request and then go back to the online program. Uh, and I think that I think that direction is easier than going online back to AB. I think we're asking them to remain there for the end of the semester unless there's a family event. Um, the family splits up, there's illness in the family, there's um, someone's displaced for whatever reason. But as I'm looking at the principles and remembering our handshake, we need to make a commitment to say, I'm going to stay in this modality for the remainder of the current semester. Right. But if they start maybe, it's easier to transition back to online. Yes, if it, it needed, but if it's just preference, we'll ask them to stay because it puts more work on the teachers uh, to toggle back and forth. Right. And then the last thing is some individuals are actually already have, are out of town for work or other reasons. And so they would not, they're not able to get back in town this week. So those individuals will not miss their opportunity to go back to the AB schedule once they go back to town. No, that's correct. Mr. Walter, thank you. Sorry. I think for clarity, if you could outline the precautions that we're taking for phase two. Uh, uh, yes, sir. I, I will. Uh, if, eliminate uh, confusion. And if the board, if it pleases the board, Mr. President, what I'll do is I'll move up part of my superintendent's report and, and discuss that now. I agree with, with uh, Chapter 2. It's part of item 4.8. Do you want it now or do you want it then? We, we can do it now if it's okay. Why don't we do it now? Okay, that's fine. Because we we're in a modality. <laughs> I like the word you used. What we will, uh, uh, to begin, the details that we're discussing, the uh, vast majority are within a communication that was sent to all stakeholders earlier today. And so uh, it includes some of the steps that we're taking. So if you, if there's anyone that lacks information that wants it, it'll be on our website. It's already been posted um, with very little, very little variation. In the context of COVID, the in-person learning evokes a strong response and, and emotional response, either in favor or opposed. Those that are opposed are simply trying to communicate their, their concerns and worry of either contracting their child contracting the virus or the child transmitting that to a loved one. We understand those concerns. Therefore, we have set protocols in place. There's an extensive document that's been shared with both the community and the board of our plan or operating plan. These plans outline steps that we take from the time students get up in the morning, they're supposed to be checked by their parents, their temperatures and some free of symptoms before they attempt to board the bus before they board the, board the bus, a touch-free temperature is taken. If the child has 104 or greater, they can't board the bus. So we're asking parents to make sure you do your part so it doesn't cause the hardship. Once students board the bus and get on campus, what's the 100.4? 100.4. Yeah, 104, I think they'd be in the hospital. In the hospital. Exactly, 100.4. On the, uh, the, and then once the students are, are being dropped off or walk, they're checked as they enter the campus as well. So at the elementary, it's handled one way, at the junior high and high school another, but all students are checked. At lunchtime, students are checked again. So we have two temperature checks during the day. Teachers and administrators are on the lookout for obvious signs. Now, we're not looking to have anybody go home that sneezes or coughs once or has a runny nose. That's not what we're talking about. Obvious COVID signs. And if they're grouped in twos, they have to be removed for at least 72 hours and be symptom free without the aid of medication before returning. Now, this is a partnership with, with parents and families as well. We're counting on them to play by these established rules in order to keep people safe. Once the kids are at school, there's protocols in place. Our facilities are getting cleaned daily. And that means the, there's a, a substance that's called Rejuvenal. It's a fine 
antiseptic that's sprayed over all of the items in the entire classroom, it, it'll kill the virus on contact. All the classrooms, the seats, the buses, the playgrounds, all of the area and facilities and classrooms will be disinfected daily. The air conditioners replace air, a complete replacement is achieved in a classroom every hour. Every 15 minutes, new air is introduced. Every hour, the air is exchanged completely. We are going to allow, as weather permits, windows and doors to be propped open to enhance the airflow. And so that we're taking every step we can to try to maintain a secure area. That doesn't mean the front doors are propped open to the school and everybody can come in and come out. That's not what we're saying. We're saying classroom doors and or classroom windows or both if they're accessible. Those are the steps that we're going to take if a child has obvious symptoms or complaints of a COVID symptom that we sent to either the health tech or uh, the area in which those having symptoms or demonstrated symptoms will be quarantined in an area until the parent picks them up. If their temperature is checked and it's 100.4 or greater, if they've been out running around the playground, we'll give it a few minutes. Invariably, it comes down. If it doesn't, we'll call the parent. The parent needs to come and pick them up as soon as possible. We're also asking parents, give your contact information and emergency contact information to our front desk so that your child's not waiting for a half an hour, an hour, or three hours to get sick. But we have plans to quarantine children and to make sure they get home safely. Are there any procedures um, in terms of the, the steps taken at the school level that any of the board members would like more detail about? Mr. Walter, do you have any other? Well, uh, as I understand it, we're on maybe so half the students are here each day, so the uh, number of students in class will be half what it normally is, and they'll be spacing and they'll be wearing masks. Yes, sir. And in fact, the number will probably be more like uh, forty percent because we think about ten to fifteen percent of our student population will remain online only the entire year. Maybe as high as twenty. So there will be at most 40 to 45 percent of the total class. So if we have a big class of 32, probably looking at more like 16 or 14 kids, we can definitely physical distance in that. I was going to mention playgrounds. Parents wanted to know where they have access. They do. Fortunately, the way we have our playground set up, there's, it's divided with fences, physical dividers. We could have the primary grade. We have the kindergarten has their own area, first through third four through six, only one class at a time is able to use the facility, playground facilities. What about lunchtime? Same thing as far as the playground is one class at a time. There's not, everybody just runs out there. The kids are gonna be, it's actually a good question. Lunchtime, uh, a number of the students will be, it depends on the grade level, will eat in the cafeteria or in the gym. Well, both areas set up at the elementary school to accommodate that. The older grades will also be eating in classrooms. Ms. Gill, the grade levels split, is it four through six? Is it primary grades in the gym? Or does it depend for the lunchtime breakfast? Okay, based on when they arrive. Hi. Um, basically, when they come in, we're going to probably kindergarten is going to come in after the one through three group and the four six group because they're so little. But as they come in off the buses, they'll just be coming in and spacing out six feet in the line. And then also we have all the benches marked six feet apart. And when we overflow, we'll go into the gym. And then as they vacate, the, uh, the uh, people that work for the food services will come behind them and clean those tables so they're sanitized. Thank you. We have little stickers in the kitchen on the seats where the children sit in their labs for a day and night and march. And uh, that's why we're using the gym and also the cafeteria, and then some of the older kids in their classrooms. And at the element, excuse me, junior high and high school, we're, we're using principally the cafeteria because it's large enough with the overflow area to achieve that. Both. Okay. Thank you. Good point. Thank you. Jennifer. Can we get a little overview of like what a typical day for an elementary school kid will look like versus a junior high versus a high school. So then parents can be adequately informed on how to approach their students, like um, if the, most of the assignments should be completed before.
before they get home or that type of thing. Absolutely. We'll start at the high school, work our way down. Um, Mr. Weber, give us an overview of a day in life as an AB student at Plymouth High School. All righty. So keep in mind, this is all new, so we're going to monitor and adjust as we go. That's the motto across all campuses, monitor and adjust. Um, so AB schedule, A student, those are the kids, last names A through K. They will be on campus Monday and Wednesday. We will follow our normal bell schedule, which was in place last year pre-COVID. So our day starts at 825. Those kids will report to their first block class. that will be a 90 minute class. Uh, there's a cut the sophomore class. They do have some skinnies in there, but they'll, they'll report to that, that class. They'll follow that schedule all throughout the day and go to each one of their four blocks or skinnies, however it calls in their schedule. The B student, on an A day, our expectation from the teachers in the classroom is that those students would be connecting with the class as if they were sitting in the class. So from home, the teachers would be sharing their Zoom lesson that is live in the classroom. The students will be able to pick up that Zoom feed and be able to participate with what's going on in the classroom. Um, and, and that may be different by teachers. Some teachers all will have something that's ready for you know, the two live days, and then there'll be asynchronous work. They'll be off, when they're off campus, they'll be working through campus and the assignments that they can pull up from campus. So that's it. either they'll work in connection with the teacher what's live, or the teacher may have something planned where they don't need that direct teacher instruction. So it is by teacher, and again, they're gonna monitor and just see what works best for the kids. Um, so on a Monday, Wednesday, those A kids are in person, B kids will be going to their classes at home, tapping into those Zoom links that they've been normally tapping into right now. Uh, the only difference is they're going to be following our normal bell schedule. So those links will also be recorded, correct? So if you have a child that's involved with sports, for example, they'll still be able to see the lecture that they might be missing because of travel. Is that That is correct. So that's the beauty of the online world right now is that the teachers are recording their Zoom live sessions, so they'll be able to pull up that if they, even if they were sick or other family emergency comes up, um, they'll be able to pull up that link and participate in the lesson that was presented by the teacher. And the teachers are not going to typically be lecturing for the whole 90 minutes. It will be a similar, we're lecturing for this time and then um, classroom type of activities or homework based on Right, that's our direction, and that's our open that the teachers are. Jennifer, can you hold your mask and uh, mic closer? I'm used to all this stuff. So, in actuality, what will happen is it's not a full hour, 90 minutes of lecture, it's segmented into different pieces. So, then they'll be doing in class assignments based on their lecture, and maybe a homework based assignment based on the lecture. So, the teachers can interact with kids individually, Correct. plus have all like those other components. And that's the beauty of the using the online tools is that they can engage with students that are in class, with students that are at home. They can create groups where they can work together and pair it digitally through those, those different things. A child in a math class may be able to maybe call in or write an email to a teacher during maybe a 30 minute period of time and get uh, live assistance even though you're home? Potentially, yes. That, that, the technology exists to be able to do that. Great. Mr. Paul Adam, um, Just to clarify, Lauren, uh, for the students that are staying full online, are they going to be going online in class with all the rest of the students? Yes, those are the now those are going to be the links that the teachers are posting. So the student at home that are choosing to stay digitally online through distance learning full time, they will access the links through the same block of time that the teachers are presenting in class. And the exception is if their schedule doesn't permit, they can pull up the recorded session. But if they want the live session with the teacher, have the opportunity to ask a question in the chat box in the Zoom. They would need to sign in at the same time that the teacher is presenting the class, block one, 825 to 950. Okay, if then the students that are full online are 
part of an A group or B group, they're also assigned to those groups or not? No, they're not. They would just have the ability to pull up those links every Monday through Friday. It would be the same thing for them. Okay, but it's still with the same class, same teacher, and so forth. That is correct. Any other questions from the, on the high school level? Okay, Courtney's turn. I'm glad we're the first because I we're doing a lot of the same things as the high school. So everything that he was just saying with AB Junior High is going to be doing the same thing. We are going to have uh, we are going to have standard dismissals dismissals from each of our class periods because we do have that smaller campus, which is those two main corridors. So we'll have seventh grade dismissed at the end of first hour uh, and then let them get to their second hour class and then we'll have eighth grade dismissed. Um, and that also will allow for fewer students in the, in the restrooms since we'll only be able to allow three to four students in the restroom at a time. I think it's three. Number of stalls is what we can allow in the restroom at a time. Uh, lunches, eighth grade is going to be going to lunch first just like we normally done. We'll have half the population uh, if that. So we do have plenty of room in the gym. And then the second grade goes outside uh, for those 20 minutes and then we switch. So second grade will go in at the end of lunch, eighth grade goes out. We do have them, uh, instead of going by each other, we have them going in opposite directions so that they won't be, they won't be passing each other on the way just to try to keep a little more distance between students. Um, in the morning, we do have, everybody's going to be coming through those front doors, but we'll be having them in. We do have somebody that's going to be stationed at the front door to keep those kids distanced. Um, parent pickup or the parent drop off, rather, we'll have three people stationed down front to take temperatures and students before they come inside. And then uh, they'll get their breakfast when they first come in. We'll have the breakfast cart set up. They'll take it to the classroom, eat the breakfast in the classroom, and then uh, deposit their garbage in the, the bins that will be outside the classroom doors. Uh, everything else, we do have a standard dismissal at the end as well, eliminate the congestion going through the doors in the front and the side. Uh, but as far as the schedule goes, it's going to be the same as what the high school is doing. Those A students are going to be in class Monday, Wednesday. Uh, Tuesday, Thursday will be the L3, L3 students and then the online students. The full online students are going to be following that same bell schedule. Any questions? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, now I'm going to take the acute angle. K through six, we're a little bit different than the high school. Uh, my teachers are just switched over to Lincoln Learning last week for uh, kindergarten is already using it, but first through fifth, six is going to maintain the ASU prep. So sixth grade, those are the only classes that are going to be moving. They're in the 80 minute blocks and we have social studies, science, English, and math. So every 80 minutes they will be switching and rotationally going to each teacher and doing their work. At this point in time, all my sixth grade teachers will be teaching online and to face-to-face -face kids, A and B. I have 33 sixth graders that are going to be online. We have a significant amount of kids that want to stay online. So we're going to see how the numbers break out tomorrow, Thursday, and next week. By next Friday, we'll make a decision if we're going to bring another teacher in to teach online to the kids we have because we want to see how our numbers are working. Today, as I was leaving at 4.30, I have parents that are changing their mind. I decided I, I don't want them online, I don't want to bring them in. So I need to give it a couple days to see where that rests. Kindergarten classes, we are running, we have about 93 kids. So when they split out, they'll have between 8 and 12 students, and they will be teaching online the first half hour of every day. They'll be teaching to their face-to-face -face students and also to the students online. And they've already told the parents this and the students this. And they've been working on that all week. So I think the parents are real comfortable with what's going to happen. They're, they're doing an awesome job. And they've been on Lincoln Learning since we started. So they have a little bit of an edge of my other one through fifth grade teachers. One through fifth grade, um, the numbers, doing the alphabet, some of the classes are lopsided. I don't want to roll them out of the like an A student with a last name starting with A to the Tuesday, Thursday, until we know how things balance out. Those teachers are going to be teaching online for now through next Friday. And again, we have to make the determination how many students are online, how we're reaching them, and what's going to be the best way to present our curriculum. We are also going to be including Monday through Thursday all of our SPED students. They're going four days. 
All of our English language learners are going four days and our foster students. So that added, we did that today, we added all of them to our class list. So that's changed our numbers a little, but we're giving them full services. So the teachers are ready to go. They have their list They talk to all their parents. Uh, and we'll see how tomorrow goes. It's going to happen. And I know we're probably going to have a line of cars out to the 260. But we're, we're fine. We have everybody set up to um, have a duty and meet buses. We have about 25 thermometers that are going to be in use. And I'm going to get some more from Dan. So we have more for the teachers. And we have a... Ryan Height's going to be on the White River bus, monitoring who's getting on the White River bus. Ryan Montgomery will be on the McNary bus. We want to make sure that if the parents are confused, we can let them know which days, Monday or Wednesday or Tuesday or Thursday, their students need to be on the bus. So we're doing that tomorrow. Also, we have to have a waiver signed for the students. We, are, we printed out a list of who signed waivers. So the gentlemen on the buses will have waivers in their hands for parents to sign if they haven't done so. And also, out where the parents are dropping, we'll also have waivers and lists. So I think they're all ready to go. They, they were ready to go when I left them tonight at 5 o'clock or 4.30. So I think we're going to be fine. It's going to happen. It's like having a baby, I told Mike. It's going to happen, and we're going to make it through tomorrow and Thursday, and we will learn from what happens. And we will be fluid and we will correct if we have any things that we need to change. So we're ready to rock and roll. And you're going to do the same start and stop time, correct? So we're not combining kindergarten through Tory for busing. 7.35 start time, 2 o'clock end time. Mr. Walter, one clarification. Uh, Dr. Irestone mentioned the White River buses. So we are busing from White River? Yes. Yes. We Last I had heard, we were not going to possibly until the end of the year, but that has changed. In the yes, the, the local conditions there are actually better off than we are here. And so the, the, when we stopped providing transportation, we said as soon as conditions mirror what we're experiencing here will continue, they're actually better than they are here. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify yes, sir. for anybody listening. That's correct. Uh, that's the case. That's the case. Any other questions or any other comments anybody thought about that you'd like to add? Yes, sir. Okay. So we're ready to vote, I think, on item 4.2. I have a motion to vote on item 4.2 from someone. I'll make that motion. Uh, I have a second. Second from Diana. All in favor? To be unanimous. So, as stated, 4.2 has passed. Okay, item um, 4.3 recommendation to approve AZ CARES procurement flexibility. Uh, this has to do with our hot spots, doesn't it? Yes, sir. Dr. Wright, you want to explain that? Absolutely. After up to $100,000, we're able to follow procurement and uh, and, and stay with that and make a purchasing decision. Once we exceed $100,000, it creates a problem for us. We have to go out to bid again. Part of the uh, Arizona CARES procurement flexibility allows you to make purchases that exceed that amount if it is for a COVID-related need. Obviously, hotspots and online bid is for us. And so we're, what we need, the, the caveat is you must receive board approval and superintendent signature. So I agree with it. I still need the board to approve it. And the amount that we exceed the uh, $100,000 is about 18,700. But we need the board's approval and they were going to be able to Any questions regarding that? So uh, can we have a motion to accept item 4.3, recommendation to approve the AZ CARES? Uh, motion from Margaret, second from Diana, all in favor? That would be unanimous. Thank you. Uh, item 4.4, we've discussed that just a little bit at the elementary school. This has to do with Lincoln Learning. Yes, we just, uh, in all of our curriculum, it's just a good practice for us to seek board approval, given this is a K through five curriculum. In effect, that's in use. We are seeking board approval for Lincoln Learning platform. We're pleased with it. As Dr. Irestone mentioned, it's worked fabulously. 
at the first grade level. We've also used portions of it at the high school for years. And so uh, we need the board's approval to continue K through five. You like it? Okay. Then we have a motion, a motion from Chuck, second from Margaret. All in favor? That would be item 4.4 passed. Item 4.5, recommendation to approve the Arizona Deaf and Blind Agreement. Dr. Wright, if we provide services for our students that are that are deaf or blind, and we are able to accommodate them and provide those, those services right on site at the old elementary school multi-purpose area. And so we've provided an area for Arizona Deaf and Blind, the same area as our special education quadrant, and we're seeking board approval for the IGA, which is a cost neutral arrangement. We're not making money, we're not losing money. We rely on them to use our service and to help our kids. Any questions? Don, we have a motion to accept item 4.5. Uh, motion from Diana, a second from Mark. All in favor? Be unanimous. Thank you. Item 4.6, recommendation to approve the NACOG Head Start Intergovernmental Agreement, the IGA with NACOG. This is for Head Start, right? It's actually a pretty exciting expansion of services provided to, provide to children that need a head start. they are kids that are delayed or are in um, situations that are less favorable. In most cases, they're just in average families, but the child is, is delayed in some way. We have currently two classrooms being used in our preschool program. It's not our preschool program, but it's the main NACOG Head Start. It's in a similar area. They're going to expand the area that they have now by two classrooms. Our one classroom that has been essentially displaced because of the expansion has been moved just around the corner. So it still has access to the playground and access to a restroom. We've uh, coordinated this change with our special ed director and the corresponding preschool program uh, employees. And so we've worked that out. And so this is going to provide opportunities for about another 35 young children in our area to have head start. At no cost to the district, I'll also add, they probably invest somewhere between twenty dollars and $30,000 into the classroom because they redo the restrooms, the flooring, the paint, and they're updating again the playground to make sure it uh, meets the NACOG restrictions and requirements. We are also able to use that as long as it's not in use for our, our own preschool babies. I did see I did see construction going on there. I mean, just a lot of activity going on there the past couple of weeks. Any questions, Jennifer? How does this impact our current preschool program? And uh, it doesn't impact the current preschool program. There's no overlap. No, and in fact, the, the, our concern was making sure that we didn't uh, our current program did not lose any space or access, and so that they had. To, all we did essentially move them around the corner to a, a very similar room, and it has access to the playground and they have access to a restroom. Any further questions? Doc, can we have a motion to vote on item 4.6? have a motion from Chuck, a second from Diana. All in favor? That be unanimously passed. Okay, Brenda. <clears throat> It's your turn to give us a monthly financial report, and actually it's two months, isn't it? Yes, it is. You know what? Just for people, so we're not looking at our phones. This was emailed to us previously, so I, that's where I'll be looking at. I'm not checking texts. <laughs> I am actually reviewing that, so okay. that's where it's located for us. And I have it up on the screen as well. So. All right, I have two months for you. The first one is the balances as of July 31st. I'm looking at auxiliary operations, tax credit, and student activities. Do you have that report, Chris? Okay, I have the balances as of July 31st, 2020. In auxiliary operations, the account balances was $121,416.87. The tax credit account had $205,061.73. Student activities, we had $191,327.12. We did not write any checks, checks for the month of July. The attached report shows the beginning balances that we rolled over from July 1st of 2020. 
The revenues that we took in for the month was approximately $1,375.70. Again, we didn't write any checks for each one of those accounts. And then the fund balances are the balances I just mentioned. The next report is the balances as of August 31st, 2020. In auxiliary operations, we had $114,324.64. The tax credit account, we had $205,399.76. Student activity account, we had $191,377.12. The beginning balances are the balances of the July 1st, 2020. Those are the balances we rolled over. The revenues we took in, was $3,065.73. The expenses are the balances from July 1st all the way through the end of August, which is accumulation of 8,400. That includes the transfer out of $225,955 to the energy and water savings account. Year-to-date expenses, which is marked number one, was $1,484,288. What we have encumbered, which includes mainly salaries and benefits, is $10,263,895. This leaves a budget balance of $2,275,261 for the maintenance and operation account. The next page is the income and expense for Fund 610 or our capital outlay account. The board adopted a budget of $657,351. Year-to-date expenses, which is part of item number one, $258,390. What we have encumbered is $128,782, item number two. And budget balance is $270,178. The next page is the cash flow statement or how much cash we have in the account. You'll see on the bottom, as of August 31st, we had an estimated cash amount of $604,464 in cash in maintenance and operation. And then in the district additional assistance fund or unrestricted capital, we had negative $133,667. The next page is the cash count from the county treasurer's office. And from the, from the treasurer's office, you'll see that we had a cash balance of one, a little over $1.7 million, $1,767,270. And our cash accounts for MNO, Fund 610, and our adjacent ways account. Do you have any questions in regards to those accounts or those reports? I have questions. No, thank you, Brenda. Appreciate that. Next item is 4.8 on the agenda, and this is a superintendent's report. Dr. Wright, I'll turn some time to you for that. Thank you. I'll cover the areas that we have not. Uh, the last two bullets, um, it was highlighted somewhat. All parents must complete a waiver of liability for, for any in-school participation, whether that's academic or extracurricular clubs or whatever. Those waivers must be submitted prior to student participating. And then we've uh, also, the, the, the county has established safety protocols for outbreaks. An outbreak is determined by two unrelated cases. So just as recent as yesterday, where we had three children in the same family that were diagnosed with the disease, an outbreak would be two children from complete different families, complete different grade or classes. They're not related either by association or blood, they're not living together, they're not on the same sports team, they're completely unrelated. In that case, there are protocols that the county steps in, does contact tracing, those, the school or the facility impacted and shut down for two weeks and cleaned and then reopened. So that's the, we hope not to get there. It's another compelling reason to go to an alternating schedule where you have 40% of the students there every other day instead of 100% there 
on any one day. And that, uh, that rounds out. I don't have anything other to add um, that we have not yet discussed. Uh, the um, extracurricular 7 through 12, is there any extra thing? Can you explain that for those that are involved? Okay, the, the way it stands right now is that the state and county levels allow for fall sports to move forward on every sport if the uh, levels are maintained or continue to decline. There is some debate over football. And so the local, the White Mountain School Districts, comprised of Sholo, Snowflake, ourselves, Round Valley, St. John's, are trying to get the, the, the EIA to say, look, what is an acceptable level? Because if they're, if they're given a statewide mandate, our area is not the same as it is in another area. And so we're planning on moving forward October 3rd with football. We have a game tomorrow, boys and girls soccer at Showa. In most instances, fan participation is limited. And in most cases, it's two tickets per athlete, so the parents can go. And uh, it depends on the sport, too, and the venue will determine how many students can go in football. We've decided we can get three tickets for the home team and two for the visitors, just because of the sheer size of our stadium. And, uh, you know, it'll be different in volleyball because there's three teams of 15, about 45. It's indoors. Indoors will have fewer participants. We'll have to work through that. Uh, so there, I will admit, there's still some things up in the air. Um, we were planning on playing all of these sports, participating across countries going forward, soccer's moving forward. There's some questions about football yet, but we still have time to address those. Are there any other questions that the board might have? Like, are there questions? That's the one question I had, kind of partially touched. All right, thank you, Dr. Wright. The next item on the agenda is just to announce the next board meeting, which will be Tuesday, October 13th at 5 o'clock at this location. So we have a motion to adjourn. Uh, chair. A motion to check. I have a second. Margaret, all in favor? That would be unanimous. Thank you. We are adjourned.